Guten Mittag. Guten Tag. Good afternoon. Welcome to our online event of Volt Nederland, shared across the border to Volt Deutschland. We believe firmly that the border areas of Europe are the regions at the core of Europe. This is where people share experiences in life and often also dialects and tradition, like Limburgs and Oschopland. They work together in their shared space and they have similar challenges. We want today to have a closer look at the border region of the Netherlands and Germany. Originally, we would have liked to really meet you. We had this idea that there is this nice street in the middle of Kerkerade Herzogenrad, which is called Neustraat or Neustraße. And this would have been the perfect place to have an event and to meet you all. However, we figured out with the authorities that maybe this is just a little bit of a difficult case, especially now in the view of the pandemic. So we decided to play it safe and to keep the distances and we do it online. So just a few words about us. We are Volt and Volt is a young and fully European party engaged into working together in Europe. You can vote for us already in 16 countries by now, with Romania being the freshest, newest country that has registered us as a party. And yes, for sure, you can vote vote in the Dutch parliamentary elections, the Tweede Kamer for Kiesinger on 17 March. And maybe you do. Listen to what we have to say today. Today, we want to have a conversation with all people present here and also all of you watching on the YouTube live stream. We think that Grenzregios formen ein Herz von Europa oder Grenzregionen bilden das Herz Europas or other regions are at the heart of Europe. And this is for us very important. We invited people from both sides of the border now. They grew up on the border or they work across the border. So today we have with us Dutch election candidates from Volt, a German Volt Regional Council representative, and also vault members with experience in cross-border matters. I'm one of them. All our guests will introduce themselves shortly in their preferred language, maybe the native one, maybe something they learn. So Dutch, German, Limburg, or English. And then we will have an open conversation together. All of you out there on the live stream, you have a warm welcome from us to post your own questions in one of these languages and put them just into the comment area of the YouTube live stream. And we thank you for them and we will pick them up as good as we can. So to just have a start, Nilefer, Nilefer Gündegan, can you say something about yourself and what makes you so special in this event? Well, I don't know whether I'm special. My name is uh, Nilefer. I'm the number two for the list for the Dutch elections to get into Dutch parliament, hopefully after March 17. Um, I was born in Turkey. I was raised in Weert, which is a, a town in Limburg, which is uh, closer to Belgium than it is to Germany. But it definitely is a southern city um, because my childhood, I used to work in an ice cream shop. And uh, every day I would have people coming from Belgium and Germany eating ice cream. And later on, I used to work in a hotel. So a lot of guests from the border also came there. So uh, Europe, uh, at least the border region, was very close by for, uh, for me. Um, so that is something I think what, what made me start realize how small Europe is and how connected it is if you live in a border region. Later on, I moved out. I went to Amsterdam, uh, studied here, uh, got a job, fell in love. So I never returned back. And it's actually more recently since I um, got involved, involved that involved that I looked into a much more in a political way at uh, border regions. And I think they are a neglected part of politics. And I think that's one of the things that a continental political party is much more aware of than national political parties are. So I'm happy to be here today. And um, uh, I think this is um, enough for now, right? Or you want more uh, me to say more? You're about to choose in as well language as in length. <laughs> more that you can say later. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And then we have to give us a bit of changes. We have Friedrich. He is actually one of those who grew up on the border. Friedrich, what makes you so special? Your world shirt immediately identifies you. Yeah, dames and heren, beste buren. 
Hallo in die Heimat. Uh, I continue in English um, because I hope we have an international uh, audience today. Yeah, my name is uh, Friedrich. I'm living in Cologne actually, but I grew up uh, at the border area of Aachen Herzogenrath. And so I would like to show you uh, just one note to that. So let's uh, have a short uh, look because I prepared uh, something for you. Um, now you should see um, the map of the region you might know from your navigation system. And um, so I'm currently sitting here in Cologne. Um, but I was born in Aachen and I grew up directly at the border to Kerkrade. So to give you an example, um, this is Bleierheide Kerkrade and this is the German part. This is Panasheide. And this small uh, line is the border. And this green is behind the house of my parents. So when I look outside my window, I don't see Germany, I see the Netherlands. Or better, I see Limburg. And yeah, of course we went there for shopping, we went there for visiting friends because some of my schoolmates were already living in the Netherlands. And when 20 years ago our pub closed, and this was here, um, we didn't have a pub anymore. So we went from this Panasiderstraat to the same named Panasiderstraat and went to the Cafe Arkens, which is here in Bleierheide. And it's still the main pub of the German village. And um, so this is one example that border regions, and especially Eurode, is a very famous part uh, for, for us. And of course, the Dutch cities are more close to us than some German cities are. So what happened? Um, last year, we had elections in the bigger cities and in the North Rhine-Westphalia area. And what happened is that we gained a lot of seats there. So four seats in Cologne, three seats in Bonn, and two seats in Aachen. And this was a very, very big success of Volt, uh, because I joined Volt three years ago, uh, because I think we need a party for the Euregio, because there is no political exchange. We live and work both parts of the borders, but there is no political really exchange and decision making. And because of our success in Germany, uh, I got uh, elected by the Volt members uh, to uh, present the seat in the Regional Council of Cologne. So this is why I'm presenting you the map that you understand that this big area has an own council. And in this council, the decisions are made for living, for areas, for example, which is nature area, which is industrial area, and which is living area. And in this council, um, there was a uh, first, uh, yeah, let's say, presentation by scientists, and they told us about a ranking of this area for living, unemployment, economic data. And I asked, hey, what about the data from our Dutch and Belgian neighbors? What's the effects? What's the exchange? Oh, that's a good question. I don't have an answer on that because we don't have harmonized data. Oh, that's a very good question, because we just focus on this area. So even in this regional council, there's a very national point of view. And so this is what I am uh, supporting uh, Nilfer and Lawrence to become elected by you, uh, dear Buren, because we need a better exchange already to have more teamwork. And to give you an example at the end, in the region of... Aachen, Herzogenrath. There are just 20 houses to buy, actually. We have a big problem with housing. And they're very expensive. In the area of Kakrade, I found at least 130 by Googling in just two minutes. So we can solve problems together, even in the regions. And the regions are uh, the forming parts of Europe. And so this is uh, what I want to tell you about it. And this is why we need to work together, because on just one part of the border, I'm alone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Friedrich. And thank you for the nice sheets. And it makes clear where this border area is, what we are talking about, because those who live in this area, they know it, but all the others maybe don't. You cross borders all the time here. So, Laurens. Laurens is not from this border, by the way. No. Laurens is some, from somewhere else on the border and can tell us a little bit what makes him so special in this event. 
Yeah, it was on the map though of uh, Friedrich, uh, but indeed, uh, Lawrence Dasse, um, the lead candidate for the Netherlands in the Dutch elections. Um, and it's really great that we are organizing these events uh, because I think indeed the border regions are the regions that do not uh, uh, are uh, anticipated on enough by the politicians currently. Uh, and I think especially Volt has a special place to ensure that the border regions uh, get more attention. And a great example already of Friedrich uh, of why that is important. Um, I was born uh, in the south of the Netherlands, uh, in Eindhoven, uh, and I grew up in a very small village, uh, Knexel. Uh, it's near the Belgian border, um, uh, where I uh, grew up until I was 18. And then I moved to Nijmegen, uh, where I uh, studied. Um, so I was also uh, close to the German border. Um, and there I also saw that uh, going to the other side of the border to play which is near to Nijmegen uh, with the bus was very difficult um, and it's strange that we pay so little attention to this because if you want to develop also the border regions within Europe you need to have a good mobility good housing market good labor market to ensure that that is developed really well and I looked up some figures really fast and we see that within the European Union you have around 40 40 40 uh, internal border regions which is quite a lot uh, and they uh, have almost 30% uh, of the EU population, which I found uh, quite a lot, uh, but that's uh, the definition of, that the European Union uses. Um, and especially these uh, internal border regions, um, they also uh, address very important cultural and uh, social economical developments within Europe, because the people in the border regions, they really live the European life. Um, and I think uh, a vault as a pan-European movement, uh, active in all the member states, um, who wants to solve the big challenges of today, also needs to act on a local level, uh, because also on a local level, it's where all the politics come into play and in the real life of the people. So I'm hoping uh, that we uh, can discuss some nice topics today. And uh, thank you very much for organizing this event. Thank you. Yes. And we have more guests. Tobias, Tobias Schindler. Guten Mittag zusammen, hallo. Hallo. <laughs> Goedemiddag. Um, yeah, I'm Tobias Schindler. I'm uh, one of the examples uh, of this region because I'm a cross-border worker. Um, I live in Aachen, but I uh, work in the Netherlands, which is actually a quite funny story um, because I wanted to um, stay in this area after finishing my studies. Um, so uh, when I went to my dentist, uh, my mund hygienist actually told me, well, there are some work opportunities for chemists just across the border in the Netherlands, which I was not aware of. Um, and I looked it up and indeed it looked very promising with uh, big chemical companies nearby. And as a chemist in Aachen, you usually focus on Leverkusen, Köln, uh, or uh, further down in Ludwigshafen. Um, so I started learning Dutch and actually ended up working in the Netherlands now. But I would have not been aware of those work opportunities if my Mund hygienist would have not told me, which is not actually what you want. You actually want politicians or uh, the labor uh, department here in Aachen to tell you that there are work opportunities very close by, but on the other side of the border. And I believe both can make a difference. And I hope Lawrence, Nilo, and Friedrich, I'm pretty confident they will make a difference and will bring this also to the political agenda. So thank you uh, for having me here tonight. Thank you, Tobias, for this nice little story, because often it's these small coincidences which have big effects on your life and also maybe across the borders. Um, we still have Fons, Fons Janssen. Yeah, good uh, morning. <laughs> yeah, I will just have to my dialect because I am the number nine candidate of Volt and I am here in the north of Limburg in the small town of Veule, over 500 people. Ik um, ben net klaar, klaar met mijn studie. Ik heb biotechnologie gestudeerd uh, aan de Wageningen Universiteit voor zes jaar. En ik heb er heel veel geleerd over voedsel en over landbouw. En als ik dan kijk van, hey, waar gaat het dan om? Hè, met de grootste uitdagingen om landbouw. Ja, dan is de Europese Unie super belangrijk. En ik heb gezien van hoe die verschillende partijen in Europa gewoon geen duidelijk beleid hebben in die verschillende lidstaten. En toen dacht ik van, ja, voelt dat dat wel? En Ik merkte ook toen ik bij Vol lid was, dat als ik bijvoorbeeld een campagne ging voeren met als de Duitse leden in, in Düsseldorf, dat ze qua gevoel en qua cultuur eigenlijk veel dichter bij me stonden dan de mensen in Amsterdam. Dus ik dacht van ja, wetten, 
Ik voel me gewoon veel meer thuis als ik kan zorgen dat de accenten van mijn regio ook daadwerkelijk vertegenwoordigd worden. Niet alleen gewoon hè, in Den Haag, maar eigenlijk overal. En ik denk van, dat dat super tof is. En daarom ben ik zo blij dat ik kandidaat mag zien hier voor Volt voor de Tweede Kamerverkiezingen. Dank je, Fons. Ik like je dialect. Want als je zegt, ik voel me thuis, dan denk ik, ik voel me thuis, ik voel me te thuis, of waar ik kom van, ik voel thuis. Because that's north of Germany. It's all very connected. It's just slight differences. And sometimes, yes, you feel more at home just over the border than in your same country, which is 200 kilometers away. We yet have another one who maybe feels at home in a different place now. That's François Gehle. Maar ja, ik voel me zeker toes. Maar dat kon ik niet gans een dialect doen, want dat, dat kind je niet verstaan. Dat is heerlijk dialect. Ik ben dus van heerlijk, ik ben een wingbulke. Uh, niet meer een wingbulke, ik ben nu een wingbul. Uh, but to change that now in, into English, perhaps for more people, to make it more accessible. Uh, grown up in Heerlen and uh, still frustrated that this border <coughs> is still functioning as a border, um, which is ridiculous. We never respected it very much as a border. I more feel like uh, an Usher Jong, uh, Emus van Orke, <coughs> uh, as Emus van, uh, van Amsterdam, an Orlander, ben ik niet. Um, <coughs> ik ben van hij, and that the kids ook niet veranderen. Uh, so I spoke in uh, dialect again, sorry. Happy to participate in this discussion because I think it's a vital discussion and thank you for having me. You're welcome, Francois. And I'm also sure that you speak fluent German because I tried. And Manchmal, ja, wenn es nötig ist. Siehst du? <laughs> I think this is bringing us a little bit, thanks for presenting and introducing yourself. This is bringing us a little bit directly into the discussion. I made an order of topics of what we could discuss. And now I have a second screen here and it's filling up with questions from the public already. So I wonder whether we jump into the topics or whether I start the whole thing with one of the discussion points that Diana gave to us. Diana was asking to the point exactly what we were playing now. This is what we can do to increase the level of English proficiency across Europe. As someone who grew up in Maastricht going to Aachen, that was way easier than going to Liège, because even though my German and French are both quite poor, communicating in English is easier in Germany. And you see, when we now interact, we speak German. Do you have any comments? Maybe Friedrich? Maybe someone else as well? Okay. Oh, I, I can start if you like. I just make it quick. Um, yeah, of course, this is basically one of the ideas which Walt is in favor of to, con to connect Europe more. So there are different ways. And just one idea I have is that we uh, support uh, learning the languages and can start with the languages which are close to our neighbors. For example, I had the opportunity to learn uh, Dutch instead of Latin at school. Mm -hmm. Guess what mistake I made? <laughs> so uh, I think there is a lot of opportunities and at least for, for the adults. So for, I think for, for younger people, it's more easy actually. Mm -hmm. But maybe we can set up some local or regional programs uh, to support adults learning uh, more uh, languages, for example. And they can start with the border regions, just as one quick example on that. Yeah. Thank you. Someone else on this? Yeah, it's, a, it's an important topic because also if you want to uh, discuss uh, uh, issues that are related to the border region, for example, if you look at mobility, then one of the uh, issues sometimes is indeed uh, language, and, um, also uh, administrative uh, language, um, but also probably Friedrich, you, you, you have it in the council, you speak uh, German, um, uh, and you need to discuss topics if you want to relate to the Dutch border uh, with people who speak Dutch. So it's important that um, for on the one side, uh, we now also speak more and more English, uh, but we also have the opportunity to learn each other's language and also use the digital means that are by hand to ensure that it's more easy to, uh, to ensure that the bureaucratic uh, barriers that we have are, uh, are mitigated. 
Well, I think there are also lessons we could learn from the European school. Um, they are all over Europe, but they are currently right now, they are not accessible for everyone. Um, they're mostly, uh, you can only uh, get your kids into European schools when you are a European working in another European country be because of professional reasons. Um, so that way, um, children who move around with their parents uh, have the same education system throughout their whole life instead of changing the system constantly. But I think w there are a lot of elements, I think, of... Are you still there? Uh, it's they start from a very early age and learning a second European language. And I think children at around the age of, of, I believe, till eight have a very fluid brain. So it's very easy for them to pick up a second language. And I think especially in the border region, I think um, uh, giving them the language of the border as a second language, I think that makes sense. So I think we can, there are smart things that we're already doing in Europe. I think it's time to adapt them and to make them accessible for more people. And I think that is a real good educational emancipation if you would start with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It would be better if people would learn that already early in their life, as good as they can. That's clear. I picked it up when I arrived here. After having been in France, learning French for three years, jumping into here, working in the Netherlands, being in Germany, having to pick it up, life, full immersion problem. <laughs> yeah, this is one of these things, but we have another one and maybe we can go now a little bit to the topics that we anyway wanted to discuss. The first one we had was a bit about living and working across the border. And what does it mean and what are the differences of the different sides of the border? And Friedrich already raised his hand, his hand, and now he took it down again. Maybe you still have something to say about it. Yeah, maybe it's a good link because there's um, a link between this region. So um, both are former industrial uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, something which is uh, not present in the uh, national parliaments. So I know from my friends and uh, in, in the part of Limburg, that they feel uh, distance and apart from the uh, Dutch government. Mm -hmm. And for example, for us in Aachen and this region, Brussels, Paris and Amsterdam are much more close than Berlin is. So at least we have the same problem, or what's say problem, the same uh, challenges. And uh, I think uh, this is the combining of uh, maybe education exchange for example, uh, also to, to exchange classes or, or courses and uh, so also in working. So we also see it. We have business parks on both sides of the border. We have business parks on the border actually in this area. And uh, this is the chances uh, uh, we have to, to bring it together. And it, I repeat myself, the companies and the families and the friends are already doing this. The politics are still in lack of giving the the framework the people need, mm -hmm. and this is so we can't tell exact details here because we have not all facts, mm -hmm. but at least we see it's possible. But still, uh, there is just the national point of view of the the member states. Yes, thank you. This also fits to two of the questions that we already received in the chat. There was one of yours, Volto. He was asking, how does Volt intend to connect the border regions? And then there was Eric Kemp, and he asked, and he tells a story, like in his region in Twente, there is already quite some political collaboration through the Euregio. We have that here as well, the Euregio, Euregio, whatever kind of language you want to use. But it can be definitely be improved in his opinion because he is missing an actual integration and not just communicating crisscross. And I think we've all seen that a bit when we tried to do our event in the new stuff. Yeah, and, and you see it in, in different ways. And I think also connecting means also to ensure that the mobility across uh, the border is very, uh, is that the borders are well connected. Um, and and I, I gave a very short example uh, of what I experienced myself in, in Nijmegen. Um, but if you want to develop certain regions, 
then you also need to ensure that people have easily, that the region is very well accessible. Um, and if you are, have only access from one side, but you're not uh, able to travel to the other side, then you only have 50% of the experience. Um, so I think making sure that also public transport is very well connected, that uh, uh, roads are very well connected, um, I think then we are also better able to develop uh, certain regions. And we have some situations where, uh, of some, uh, where, what you also mentioned, Iris, where it's already being developed, uh, I believe in, in Enschede, where they have some uh, experience now running, uh, where they uh, restarted old uh, uh, train networks, and where you can also see that the development is going up already. And I think uh, making sure that Friedrich uh, is uh, discussing this with his counterparts uh, in Limburg, but also uh, Niederfer and myself, making sure that um, the, the barriers to discuss this and to make sure that uh, it's able to, to work together to uh, uh, open up the border regions, I think it's very uh, important that we start doing this as soon as possible. Yeah. Franz also likes to say something. Yeah, yeah, because right now in my campaign, I see directly the benefits of being part of a European party instead of a national party. So yesterday I had a discussion with the Labour Party here in the Netherlands, uh, PvdA and Kerkrade, about drug policy. And there is a lot of problems regarding drug usage and drug trading uh, with cr criminality in the South. And uh, when I was asking them after the interview about how much do you collaborate uh, on a structural basis with Parti Socialist from, from Belgium and with uh, SPD in in Germany, they said, yeah, well, it's all about some personal connections that you have. Mm -hmm. And I think that what Volt is doing is really upgrading uh, political collaboration among the voters because we have one digital platform. We are a digital party. If I need someone, or I need to get advice. I have a lot of people that I can just go into the database. And especially my uh, my supporters from Maastricht, they really just have a constant chat with the with the neighbors. Uh, from that are also uh, full members um, that they really discuss on a continuously basis these kind of problems and find more nuanced and better political solutions. Whereas we see that a lot of national parties just yeah, only look the responsibility within their borders, but not with the responsibility of all the people around it. Mm -hmm. Tobias, what do you want to contribute to this? Yeah, I just want to add to that. Uh, there is a pretty good example uh, that bothered me for quite some time. Um, that is the DGD, which is in the Netherlands, a uh, quite important tool to access your health insurance, uh, to do your taxes, but it has not been accessible for cross-border workers for quite some time. Um, and this is just one of the examples that makes it quite difficult when you are living in one country and then working in another country. They have recently uh, changed it, so now it is accessible. Um, but I think, yeah, Bolt being a pan-European party uh, is not focused um, solely on national politics, but uh, also has the whole picture, the whole European picture um, on its view. And uh, then we can actually make a difference um, to change that in the future. Yeah, just to shortly add on that, that because indeed what we would want uh, to, to have is a European digital identity. To ensure that working across the border, uh, but also uh, living across the border, becomes more easy for this. Mm -hmm. Francois, a very simple and practical <clears throat> uh, thing to add to this. I am Dutch. I am insured in the Netherlands with an international health insurance. Mm -hmm. I'm living in Germany. No one knows who is going to give me my vaccination. Oops. No, I'll find out, but this is this is one of those examples where you see very much now in Corona time that all the people living on a side of a border they are left out <clears throat> because they are one way or another they are just missing. On a side note, I should find out as well, Friedrich. Yeah, just just to say at this round. We have luck with the Dutch and German part of the border. Since one year, the Belgian part of the border to Germany is nearly closed. Mm -hmm. And since more than 20 years, we don't have this situation. There are two generations who don't know that there is a kind of border, actually. So we can be happy that at this point, we are still a little bit better organized already than the Belgian part. But uh, this is still a very big problem. And this somehow shows to me, when I listen to all of you, 
where you're still fighting also on, let's say, the daily basis and the small level. And uh, I have a question here of somebody from the chat. and He's pulling it to the high level. I will simply throw it in for you. Let's see what we make of it. It's from Klaas Spahns. It's in Dutch. Wat zou jullie ultieme eindplaatje zijn omtrent Europa? Heel Europa als één land? Of hoe zien jullie de uniciteit en beslissingbevoegdheid van de individuele landen? That is, if you pull it to the highest level, think about it. Ja, yeah. if, if I can um, start with that question. For us, um, the, we, our ultimate goal um, is to have a real European parliamentary democracy. Um, you have power, you have to have contra power. So um, the executional part of the trias politica is being um, checked by parliament. And currently we have this weird situation that this, what they created, the founding fathers, um, the Council of Europe has a veto right. So every politically, democratically, um, decision made by the European Parliament can be overruled by one country. Uh, and we have to get, get away from that system because we want to connect 450 million Europeans. Uh, because sometimes, and actually in a quite a lot of the times, it stands in the way of uh, important decisions, whether it's how we are going to respond to uh, Belarus or what we're going to do about climate change and all kinds of other stuff. And in the end solution, I think there might be, I don't know, because I don't think that I'll will still be around, although I say I'm going to be very old. And there might be a new situation, because if we think of uh, in a historical context, slightly over 100 years ago, it was Bismarck who started to found Germany as it is. The founding of Germany is not that old. The founding of Italy is not that old. So a lot of European countries, and don't forget, please, of after World War I, uh, the whole of uh, the uh, Austrian-Hungarian empire just fell apart. So who knows what future might bring? Because back then, history, no one would tell that this is the current map of Europe. For me personally, that is the second important tier. The first important tier which drives Europe or, or falls as Europe is to create a true democracy, a true democracy which is transparent, which is, has its checks and its balances. And I would like to add some little or actually big thing to it. The, the rest of the world looks at us mostly like that way. I mean, they just started to raise money from the outside capital market and they just plunged on it. So now member states do not have to pinch in money for the Corona Recovery Fund. If I'm uh, I'm looking at other, because I might say something tricky right now, but, um, and so the rest of the world is just looking at us and has a lot of confidence. And it was really like a matter of time to collect that money. It was really easy. So the rest of the world has a lot of confidence in us to, you know, bet, lend us money. So I think it's time to see at us as one of a, gi a huge and important gigantic project in which we should have confidence. And that brings us back to the regional part. And one of the things that we should do as Europeans is make sure that the regional regions of Europe are much better interconnected in all kinds of ways. Education, housing, transport, and national governments have been neglecting it. So our future is Europe. So our politics should be European. Francois. As a consumer of Europe for many decades, and born on a border. I have questioned myself so often when people uh, are afraid to lose national identity. Um, how artificial is that? Yes, I'm Dutch. Yes, I'm Limburgs. Yes, I'm European. Yes, I am of this world. And I think uh, there is some sort of fear mongering this question. And most of the people from Holland do not come from the Ronstadt. They come from the border. And um, I wonder often, how is it with them? <clears throat> do they really feel it as a problem that on the other side of the border there is a different country? Because in daily life, I think, it's there. 
daily routine, at least it was for me. I remember being very young, going to Switzerland with my parents, and at, at the Swiss border, we wondered, shit, do we have passports with us? Because when we went to Aachen, we never had a passport. There was this little house with a guy sitting behind uh, a newspaper, waving people by, and, and that, that was the border. We didn't have a border. I mean, Schengen came. For me, that was a joke. So uh, I, I think we have to realize we have to lose fear. We have fought many wars in, in, in Europe, and we should get rid of that fear. And Holland will stay Holland, Germany will stay Germany, and Europe will, stay, uh, will become Europe. And that, I think, is, for me, as a consumer of Europe, that is my wish, that Euro Europe becomes Europe. And now it's a lame duck. Thank you, Francois. Because this is the promise that I was made when I started to travel around Europe and live in it in 2002. Laurent has a raised hand. And just in addition to uh, um, uh, the story that Nilfer was also telling is, of course, we have a lot of lawmaking also on the European level. Um, but the implementation of this and the interpretation of this sometimes still differs within the country. So the implementation of European law is different sometimes in Germany and in Belgium and in, in the Netherlands, which leads to um, yeah the, the barriers that we all face. And um, I think it's very good that we have a closer look to also how these uh, laws are implemented and how they relate to each other. And you already we have some uh, initiatives like the Institute for Transnational and uh, Euregional Cross-Border Cooperation and Mobility of the University of Maastricht. And they also look at uh, current and future uh, national and EU law um, to ensure that, well, the, the people that deal with these uh, uh, laws, that they um, um, have more, um, uh, that, that it's better connected, sorry, that it's better connected for the future. And I think that's very important that we also look at it from that perspective. Friedrich. Yeah, very great. Uh... Um, let's say uh, kick off for, for this uh, um, part which where I see Volt, uh, which is our I think main task. Uh, you mentioned uh, the knowledge, you mentioned the uh, scientists and experts, for example, at the Maastricht University, and um, and this is the very big chance in this region ex we are talking about. So we have this great uh, university which is uh, on political studies on Europe, which is, uh, let's say, a very elite university for this. But we also have a region which is European, which offers so many uh, opportunities and possibilities. And we can show exactly here that it's possible. And there are people working on the, on the borders and we need to listen to them. So you mentioned this word and this is exactly uh, what, what we all can do. And I see the chat a little bit parallel. Um, we are listening to that, what these people are saying, and uh, we need to uh, transform it into our uh, ideas for the future. And uh, I don't see any other party uh, who is doing this for border regions and uh, without any vault uh, uh, glasses. I don't see any other parties on Dutch or German side which is having this look together for these communities. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope the, the people uh, from the Dutch part see this, uh, that, that we have this exchange because I, I was in other parties. I, I had a lot of uh, events like this also on the tables. Yes, there was this German sit guy sitting there. There was this Belgian guy there. But after it, they go to the national states and said, OK, this was fun. And uh, I, I'm believing that together, we, when we invite the people and we talk to them, that we can bring them together. Because you see it in the cities, in the regions that they want to do this. Yeah, thank you, Friedrich. This brings me to another question from the chat, which is somehow connected with it. That's something I experience here in Aachen. And that is the question, if Volt Nederland is also planning to run more locally in the provincial elections or for city councils like in Maastricht, because I think this is key to be able to act on the borders. Is not yeah, definitely. Um, so the uh, local uh, elections will be uh, next year. 
uh, and Volt will definitely be running for the uh, local elections as well. Uh, I know that some cities are already preparing for this, um, that they're already uh, writing policy um, to ensure that um, they have a good program. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, after the national elections, we uh, will immediately start with the campaigns for the local ones. Thank you. There's another one into this, which is a bit an interesting one, because it is not about the Dutch-German border, it's about a special form of other borders. It's the question of who sehen jullie de grensregio's als EU-landen met niet-EU-landen grenzen? Wat zijn daarin de obstakels en kansen? Dus what are the chances and what are the hurdles if we have we are talking about borders which are going over to non-EU countries? Well, I, I think one of the biggest challenges of that is when you step outside of the EU, mostly, you get into either Russia or you get into Turkey. And uh, with Turkey, the uh, we are together within the NATO, uh, so there are some um, uh, agreements together. And uh, they have agreed on the Copenhagen criteria. So there is some common understanding between Turkey and uh, Europe. It is definitely not going smooth. We can be honest about that um, because Erdogan is um, representing a form of democracy. And I can speak openly about it with my Turkish background that I do not approve of as a, someone who is you know, a big fan of liberal democracy. Uh, Russia is even more autocratic, I would say, than Turkey is, as far as I know, at least. Maybe I'm wrong, but as far as I know. Um, and Russia does not, you know, give a lot about, you know, what other countries think. Look at how the Krim got annexed. At the same time, we should be very well aware. And I think this is something that no national country can s solve on its own how to deal with the external borders. Then there are two other countries which are not part of the EU, but we do have a border with them. That's the United Kingdom and Norway uh, and Switzerland. I'm almost forgetting about Switzerland. And obviously we're smaller countries. I'm thinking about Liechtenstein, thinking about Andorra and the Vatican, but you know, um, but anyway, we have, uh, because they have a true liberal democracy and there is much more openness there, it is much more the trade part that we have to agree on. Um, but that's not that complicated. Oh, obviously, it's complicated, but it's not that complicated because there is a common understanding on how to act with each other. Mm -hmm. Having said so, everyone prospers when there's peace, when there is stability. So I think in general, when we have our uh, outside borders, the main um, and the first thing that we will always aim for is to, to have a good diplomatic relationship with the other country. Uh, and if that's not possible, then as one Europe, we should speak with one voice on how to deal with it. And that is one of the topics why uh, Volt favors uh, a foreign, common foreign affair. So we can have one agreement on how to, um, you know, uh, continue and work on topics like this with the external borders, non-EU countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nilefa. Well, we just have to raise 10 to this. I just want to add something to that because I can imagine it will be a very tricky situation if you're uh, living across the border to another country that is not part of the EU because there will be probably contracts between that country and the other respective country. And that is also what we are having here within Europe itself. And that is probably from a political perspective fine because there is a contract, but from a person making use of it, so being a customer of that, uh, treaty, it's quite tricky. So, for instance, there's a treaty between the Netherlands and Germany regulating where you pay your taxes, uh, but it's quite difficult to follow and it doesn't make life very easy um, because there is no, let's say, overall European uh, legislation on it and there are all kinds of things you need to know and need to figure out. One example is uh, in uh, the Netherlands, everybody has it about the new Manier van Werken. Uh, just, uh, that in the uh, future, we will probably work uh, more from home. Um, which is as a cross-border worker quite a tricky situation because you are limited to the number of days that you are allowed to work from home. Otherwise, you need to pay taxes and social security in both countries, and that will be pretty expensive. Um, so what I just wanted to mention is, um, yes, it's a difficult situation living at a non 
uh, border with a non-EU country, but also within Europe, it's still tricky and there are contracts, but it doesn't make it easy as a customer of it. Thanks, Tobias, because you're right. I know that at least for France, this kind of agreement between Germany and France is from 1958 or something. And that also was in a time when this kind of working like we do now since a year very frequently just from home uh, or that we travel so much for business, that was not yet the case. Fons, you have a raised hand as well. Yeah, I also want to stress that we not only have neighbors like on the eastern part of Europe, but if we go a lot to the west, to the Caribbean islands, also multiple European countries also have islands that have warm ties or are still part of any kingdom. Uh, for instance, I went last September to St. Martin to solve a big and biodiversity crisis with the seaweed, which is coming there because of, of climate change. And what I see is that with St. Martin, we are next to the French part uh, of St. Martin. And back with Corona, but also the Dutch part is not part of the EU, but the French part is. There was a conflict with the USA regarding tourism. And um, so that island was blocked halfway because the French decided to not allow any American tourists to come to that e part of the EU. And I think that is super silly that we are not taking that into account. So I think also regarding uh, outside borders uh, in the Caribbean area, we as, as a European Union ideally yeah, want to support that also with one inter-regional group uh, regarding economic uh, renovation because they are... Uh, back on track on a lot of uh, challenges regarding a sustainable economy or our environmental goals. Thank you. Thank you, Fons. Yeah, this brings me to yet another thing. We have still also the question on our list in that case. How is it going on when we talk about those things which have not to do, nothing to do with living working, exchanging, having taxes, having all these kind of things. Often we see that there are communication issues when it's cross-border or things are not aligned nicely one to the other. And then we also had on our list this kind of sensitive topic. What about criminality? There are people in societies always which will sort of misuse the chances of society and we cherish our open borders, but we somehow also need to make sure that they're safe and that yeah, we have a peaceful and well-working society. What can we do about that? You see these discussions often that people then say, oh, we need to close down the border, which is not necessarily the solution. Francois? Well, <clears throat> being brought up in Helen, uh, Helen at that time was the number one heroin city in the Netherlands. It was not Amsterdam. I didn't notice that going to school because it was um, really the, the tough stuff of criminality. And if we had international police force being able to act across the border, the border would not have been so interesting for criminality. So for me as a consumer, um, uh, it's important that uh, police agencies and safety uh, can be uh, dealt with across the border and it's not hindered by a border. It's important for the people who live there that this border is, is only functioning for criminality. And if you say, well, close the border, the criminals will say, thank you, because we don't care. You don't close it for us. Mm -hmm. So... Borders are never really closed. We've seen that in Germany. Somebody just raised the hand. Friedrich. Yeah, exactly what Francois said. We, we, we saw it 60 years ago when we had the smuggler routes. And uh, one my grandfather was one of them. And I already uh, told Franz Zimmermans, the vice president of the European Commission, once we had a, a discussion, that his father, who was a, um, a police officer, had done his job better maybe i didn't was here so thank him <laughs> and um so we see borders are not stopping criminals so we need a better uh, policy together in europe against criminal uh, activities we see there is the ports in antwerpen and in rotterdam 
and we see that one of the main routes is on western germany for example the uh, highway 4 in aachen and the other parts and um, so this is what we can do together and just one aspect from the german side in germany the police station for border or, or border issues has less than 50% uh, of their people in, in jobs. So there, there's a big lack of people uh, uh, on the positions. So mm -hmm. we, we, the, we can demand cross border, uh, close borders or not when there are not en enough police uh, officers uh, in their offices. So uh, I'm in favor of an open border with very good uh, police, which is working together really working together, get competences maybe for both sides of the border and to have a really better exchange, mixed teams, for example, best practices and uh, very uh, punctual actions. So no closed borders, but very good uh, together working when they are uh, uh, chasing these uh, people because we not only have the drugs, we also have the problems of the people which uh, blow up the ATMs, for example. Mm -hmm. They can disappear very rapidly over the border. Fonts. Yeah, I also did some research on uh, on a, uh, the import of illegal drugs in these ports, and uh, what we were thought really want to do is that uh, the currently Europol, uh, the European Police Force, it can only facilitate the very various national police forces. But if you really want to. Uh, tackle down the drugs import in Rotterdam, it will switch to another port in Western Europe. Uh, so you, what we really want is that the Europol actually can also take an initiative to precisely tackle down all imp uh, drugs import from the various ports and that it's not only facilitating, but they, they can initiate an action and take the national police forces alongside to be much more effective in tackling international crime and, and drugs. Thank you. Nilefe, you also have a raised hand. Yeah, I, I wanted to say something completely different, maybe slightly off topic, about crossing the border. When we talk about Europe, or when, I don't know, obviously I was raised in the Netherlands, I got education in the Netherlands, but when you're taught about the rest of Europe in the Netherlands, this was what I was told. The Spanish came here, they caught, they occupied the Netherlands for 80 years and then they went. And then the French came with the Napoleon army and then they, you know, uh, the, the Netherlands was part of Napoleon. And then the Germans obviously came and they stole your bike of your grandfather and they never gave it back, you know. So when we teach our children about Europe and what Europe has done and how they cross borders, it's always negative. But we hardly ever talk about the good parts and how we, you know, made a fusion of our thinking and of our, you know, creative parts. And for example, like the master Rembrandt was influenced by someone like Caravaggio and, and how architecture and how music, you know, cross borders at the same times. We, we should, I think, instead of only telling what goes on the bad way, also the criminals right now, that's also something that is negative. We should also talk about how we, you know, influence each other on a good way. And we talk not enough about that, I would say. And I think uh, that is something that fault, you know, which cherishes especially culture. Uh, we can learn uh, in the Netherlands a lot from you guys in Germany because you're better at it than, than we guys are in the French also and how to protect our culture and educate our children better at, at culture and, and have a better understanding of how Europe was never an island, all those countries. It was always, you know, connected with other parts of Europe. So that is, I wanted to share something positive at least. Nilefer, thank you. And you're also responding a little bit to a question that I do not even have the time to mention anymore. That was like, how do we exchange? How do we learn from other countries? And there is a lot, and this is also one of Walt's core points. It's sometimes called best practice in the sense of look around you. What do other countries, other cities do well that you can just transfer to your own? Francois, you still have a raised hand on this. 
Well, yes, I would like to, to add to Nilofer's comment, <clears throat> also because you mentioned Turkey before, uh, and you mentioned the Dutch uh, tried to, to, trying to fight for their freedom against the Spanish. That was actually financed by money that came from Istanbul together with the tulips and with hockey and with a lot of things that the Dutch learned uh, with university exchange with Turkey. So wouldn't it be fun that if we had a unified strong Europe to confront Turkey again in a new fashion and say, would you like to join us? and that we come together again like we once were together in good old times. As you said, why do not change it in a positive way? Because we can do one another so much of favors and help one another. That is, I think, the challenge that Volt is not uh, looking away from. And that is why I like Volt. Thank you, Francois. Nilefer, if this is not burning, because we slightly roll to the end of our event, I would think I would like to ask you yet two questions, which are super pragmatic, which is Walt. So one is coming from someone with the avatar name of Ms. Montre. Ms. Montre is asking, what are your ideas to fix the Dutch Operbar for Fuhr, the Dutch OV check-ins, and the fact that buying train tickets across borders is made harder than national tickets? What international train system do you propose? Well, I am not an expert on this topic, but, you know, for me, it is bizarre that as such a rich country and as a such a rich continent, you know, when you go into Asia, uh, I haven't been to Japan, but everyone who has been to Japan tells me how the, the bullet train makes it very easy to, to commute, to have things. I think there is a lot of inspiration to, to get from other countries as well, sometimes outside of Europe, to connect Europe on a better way. Um, how to do it, I have not studied anything regarding mobility. I am not the right person to ask on how to do it, but I am a favor um, and a fan of it. That's what I could tell. Yeah. Someone else? Yeah. Uh, that's, I, I've, I've got a transport guard. Why are we not having a European transport guard that is recognized by all the, um, the, the machines in Europe? Uh, so that all, everything gets digitalized, but why are we not only have, besides a national cards, also have a European card system that you can just put credit on it, that maybe uh, also this one I need to update uh, regularly, but you can also do that automatically. So these kind of digital innovations, they are now, uh, especially also with, with the, the car sharing, all these things we can, from a digital technological perspective, are very easy to tackle, but it requires a lot of European coordination, not only national coordination to make that happen. And therefore also, uh, Fold has a cutting edge advantage because we bring that to all the border regions uh, on the table. Uh, if we really want to have sustainable uh, public transport to reach also our climate goals. Tobias, you still have a raised hand, 30 seconds. <laughs> I uh, just want to add to that. Um, yes, indeed, we need uh, to have European solutions, but there are already um, at least projects to find local solutions. So a couple of weeks ago, we organized a discussion in the Oreche Mois Rhein uh, with the ASEAC, uh, which is the local public transport company in Aachen. And they are looking into a project to um, organize uh, e-ticketing for the region so that you're able to use your mobile phone to buy tickets uh, for the Netherlands or also for Belgium. And we need more of those initiatives and those projects to interconnect the public transportation across the borders. And that, I think, is a good example, um, but we need more of those. Thanks, Tobias, and thanks to you all because now we're coming to the end of the event already, although my chat window is still full of questions and I really had to make choices. This is not about judging whether a question is good or bad. I just have to make choices. So I, we tried to stick a bit to these inter-border questions. And I just would want to ask everybody who is watching the live stream, go on on social media. There will be answers. Volt Nederland, Volt Germany, all the other Volts will answer to your questions. Maybe it might take a while, take some patience, but we are also interested to know what people think out there. And so there's little for me to be left to do. I would like to thank you all, the guests, also the people outside on the live stream for sharing all your thoughts and plans and the questions. And we would like to 
have this approach of a work of a Europe working together to overcome our shared challenges and also the other ones and think of voting vote in the Dutch parliamentary elections on 17 March. Go for the Tweede Kamer for Kiesinger and then we will have a European approach. I thank you very much. Dank jullie allemaal. Herzlichen Dank euch allen. We hope to see you soon. Tot ziens. Bis bald. Doei doei.